Have you ever been on holiday and you visited the ancient ruins of some dramatic castle? Or perhaps you've wandered through the empty shell of a once glorious abbey that has fallen to the ground. Or maybe you've visited somewhere where they've discovered a Roman villa and it's all been buried underneath the ground for countless centuries and it's recently been uncovered, parts of it have been rebuilt. And then as you wander around the ruins of these glorious structures, you wonder to yourself, where did they go wrong? How is it that they built such glorious and wonderful things and yet they are ruins today? As we look around the state of our church today, we can think that we're, this is ruined and there is no hope for us and that it will all be buried under the ground. And it doesn't matter anyway because Jesus is going to return any minute now and he'll sort out the problems it's not our responsibility. Welcome to Parkside Evangelical Church. I'd like to welcome you to this worship service as we dedicate ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to put off those defeatist attitudes thinking there's nothing that we can do. We want to turn to the word of God and discover from the authority of the word of God itself that we have hope, that we have work to do, that our glorious King, King Jesus, still wants to use people like you and me to advance his kingdom and to restore the glory yet to come and to build on all the great things that we have received from our forefathers. We're going to be turning to the word of God and we're going to be singing God's praises. We're going to be singing familiar hymns and new hymns and we're going to be hearing from God's work. But we always do this at God's invitation. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 99, and it's a glorious reminder that Jesus is our King. He is in control, and all authority in heaven and on earth has been delivered to him. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. And so we're going to come to this glorious king whom we worship. And we're going to say, sing, the Lord is king, lift up your voice. Be encouraged, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Be encouraged. Jesus is on the throne. Will you sing this with me?
Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we come to you, the triune God, the only God, the only true living God, the one who has revealed yourself and the one who has displayed your majesty, your glory, and your power. We come to you as King of kings and Lord of lords. We come to you to worship at your footstool, to acknowledge your authority from your throne, to bow before your scepter, and then to rise up again as ambassadors to extend your kingdom. Lord, draw close to us, because, Lord, we long to draw close to you. We come at your invitation, acknowledging who you are and remembering again why it is that we come. We come to rest on you to find our strength in you, to find our peace and our joy in you. Bless us and enable us this hour, dear Lord, as we put aside time to worship you and adore you, to sing your praises, to find comfort and hope for our own personal lives, but also to find courage and conviction to advance your kingdom. Bless us, dear Lord, and help us to do this for the glory of your name. In the precious name of Jesus, Our Lord, our Saviour and our King, we pray it. Amen. We're going to continue to worship God as we sing this. We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. Sing this with comfort and joy in your heart.
We're going to come to God again and we're going to seek him and pray for our own needs and the needs of people in our nation and the needs of uh, the people that God has entrusted to our hearts. You bow your head. Lord God Almighty, we come to you again and we come to you confidently because you are a prayer answering God. We can look back at the week, we can listen to the witness of our brothers and sisters in Christ And we can see that you have answered prayer again and again, dear Lord. You have answered prayer. And sometimes, Lord, we come to you and we we have prayed and you haven't given us the things that we wanted. But you always give us the things that we need. As a wise and loving Heavenly Father, dear Lord, you sometimes have to say yes. Sometimes you have to say no. And sometimes you have to say be patient. Just wait. And so, Lord, help us to overcome our impatience. Help us to trust you when you say no and help us to give you thanks and praise and worship when you say yes. Lord, we come to you with all of our aches and pains, all all of our worries about the future, all of our anxieties about money, our anxieties about the state of the world. We look at the awful things that are happening in Ukraine. We are filled with fear. We're aware, dear Lord, that Uh, This war could escalate and go out of control. And Lord, we pray for our governments. We ask you, dear Lord, to give wisdom to our governments and to restrain them, to drive them to the negotiation table, to seek peace. Oh, Heavenly Father, please end the killing, end the war. Have mercy, dear Lord. And Father God, uh, we want to come to you not just with our national and international needs, We come to you as as well, as a nation, seeking repentance, asking, dear Lord, that you would rebuild your church, seeking, dear Lord, your forgiveness that we have turned away from you. Let us not be discouraged, dear Lord. And finally, Lord, we come to you with our own personal needs. Lord, we lay at your feet our anxieties about our own personal health, our frustrations about our failing bodies, We lay at your feet our desire to find hope and reconciliation with you. Dear Lord, give us your peace. Provide for us the healing we needed. We need. Show us, dear Lord, your love, mercy and compassion. And give us strength. We pray especially for those who are recovering from operations. Lord, have mercy on them and may they have full restoration to health. We pray again, Lord, for our friends, our loved ones, our neighbours. Bring them healing. Most of all, bring them to Jesus. Pray especially for those in our immediate family that don't yet know Jesus as Lord and Saviour. Have mercy on them as well, dear Lord. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to turn, turn to God again in song. And we need to remember, as we fight the Lord's wars, the weapons of our warfare are not fleshy, they're not carnal, they're not of this world, but they're mighty through God, through the pulling down of strongholds. Because we don't flesh, uh, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but we battle against the principalities and powers of this present evil age. We battle in heavenly realms, and the weapons of our warfare are prayer, they are preaching, they are the word of God and the truth, and they are mighty through God. So, we remember that the battle is the Lord's, and if God is on our side, Who can come against us? Will you sing this with me?
came across this photo of a once beautiful palace or temple that the jungle has overtaken. It reminded me an awful lot of Jungle Book. Remember that book? Jungle Book with Mowgli and Baloo the bear and them dancing around these ancient temples. And there's a certain romance to these glorious old temples. Uh, they they are, have a beauty of their own. Maybe the original temple itself before the jungle overtook when it was once all glorious uh, looked highly, highly impressive. But even now, that glory is there. It's trapped there in those ruins. Maybe you've been, uh, been seen photos of glorious palaces in Central America or uh, South America. And you remember that those countries once had enormous wealth and there was great European sophistication. And here was this mighty palace that wouldn't look out of place in France or in Britain or in Berlin. And uh, yet the jungle has overtaken it there as well. These beautiful palaces have fallen on hard times, and yet they still retain an incredible beauty. In our own country, we can visit beautiful uh, monasteries and abbeys uh, that were the victims of Henry VIII's uh, uh, purge of the church, his reclaiming of the lands and his uh, theft of the church lands, him claiming them for himself and giving them out to his friends and fellows that kept him in power and uh, the disillusion of the monasteries led to their ultimate collapse, their irrelevance and still those monasteries are testimony to the love and dedication of the people of God in former ages as they built such beautiful architecture and they still retain incredible beauty. The desire of every Christian perhaps is to see those houses where God was once worshipped rebuilt. But as we look at most ruins, there's something really quite depressing about most ruins. Here's the ruins of a once beautiful building inside and it's just chaos and mess. There's no romance about some ruins, even though the architecture may be beauty. Sometimes they can be ugly, but sometimes the buildings themselves were never beautiful in the first place. They were just functional, it's like this old factory. Uh, a bed of rubble and ruins, rust and decay everywhere. We can look at some old uh, corridor in a, in a long neglected hotel or house and the uh, roof has fallen through, there's damp everywhere and you just think, oh, what a mess. But sometimes we can see the tragedy, a tragedy of a house that has been set on fire, it's been boarded up, it has faced terrible, terrible times and yet through love and dedication, through the family that once lived in that house, there's a desire to rebuild. And the rebuilding can sometimes be even more beautiful than the original building itself. In America, there are many beautiful Victorian houses that through the 20th century fell in, uh, onto poor times. And yet people, out of love for the beauty of their architecture, restored them and restored them to an extraordinarily high standard. If you go to Europe as well, you wander around many of the European streets and um, uh, when after the Second World War, for decades, poverty was uh, throughout the whole of Europe and people were just trying to make ends meet. They had bigger priorities to rebuild the arc um, than to look after these old buildings. But as Europe became more prosperous, there was a greater desire to rebuild. And there's always hope in the midst of these ruins. This is typical of the type of thing that we rebuilt in Britain after the Second World War. After the terrible bombing of the Second World War, there were many, many beautiful buildings that were uh, bombed to rubble. And sadly, rather than try and recreate the, uh, the architecture, the money wasn't available, nor was the will. There was a desire, we need to put aside the past and rebuild a glorious new future. And yet this glorious new future that we are now living in is uglier than the previous age. And yet in Budapest, in Hungary, this building has actually been pulled down or, re, uh, or uh, re, um, repurposed and reclad. And they have rebuilt the beauty of the original architecture. It doesn't always have to be from beautiful to ugly. 
I wish that this was a lesson that our own government in Britain would learn. I wish that people would recognize that we can take some of the, uh, uh, some of the shortcuts, architectural shortcuts that we had to take in the 1950s, 1960s, as we were, had to uh, build enough houses for all that were ruined during the Second World War. And we could repurpose those along with the office blocks that look such a monstrosity, just as they have with this building in uh, Budapest. There is hope. Out of the ruins can come something better or just as good as what was there before. And this is a message that Nehemiah and Ezra had. I understand that one or two chronicles was probably written by Ezra. Ezra had this great purpose that God had laid on his heart to return and to encourage the people of God who had been exiled in Babylon to rebuild out of the rubble. As he returned, all around him was a mess. He looked at the, uh, the, the broken down walls and just as you might have felt pretty depressed as you looked at those broken down factories and you would have thought, where, where would you possibly start trying to make that thing look beautiful? How could you rebuild that? It would have been very easy for people returning from Babylon. Babylon with all of it, the height of its sophistication, the splendor of its temples, the glory of its, of its palaces to come back to the rubble of Jerusalem and think, well, gosh, well, this is a bit second rate. This isn't worth rebuilding. But Ezra's primary purpose, the thing that he had laid on his heart was to convince the people of God not to give up, to have courage, to realize that there is hope because God is on their side. Today, we live in the midst of defeatism among many Christians. There's def two defeatist attitudes that uh, I think that make Christians feel, well, there's not too much we can do about the decay of our culture and our society. There's really, uh, we, we just need to concentrate on preaching the gospel and then Jesus is going to rescue us and bring us home and he'll sort it all out for us. And there's two defeatist attitudes, I think, that make people accept the immorality and corruption of our culture, the fact that we, our culture has become uh, um, increasingly secular and multicultural and multi-religious and now uh, uh, Christianity is just one flavor among many flavors and a highly uh, unpalatable flavor to many, many people. There's nothing that we can do about this because throughout the whole of our lives it's been nothing but defeat, defeat, defeat. And so though the rubble may look sad, though the decline of the church may be inevitable, there's not too much that we can do about it. And so one of the defeatist attitudes that underscores this is that defeat is inevitable. In fact, it's really to be looked forward to. After all, doesn't the word of God say, doesn't Paul say to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, understand that this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never come able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. So that's it. It's prophesied in the last days, just before Jesus returns, and before there's the new heavens and new earth and the last judgment and everything else. Everything has to go to, go to hell in a handbasket. It's all got to go downhill. And the very fact that we see the fulfillment of all of these, in day, uh, these things in our own day is proof that Jesus is about to return and only he can fix it. But we need to remember the context. Paul is writing to Timothy before the temple has been destroyed. He's writing in the last days of the old covenant period. He's writing to Timothy to address problems that were in Timothy's lives, in Timothy's church, that were relevant to Timothy in the first century. And he's saying, look, you're living in the last days of the old covenant period. And don't be surprised that people are lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, and all the rest of it. Don't be surprised. Don't be defeated. Don't worry. Because in previous ages, there's been people like Jennies and Jambres who oppose Moses. 
And so don't be surprised that you too, in your age, are uh, having to defend the truth. Don't think that, it's, uh, that you can uh, need to give in to this. He goes on to say, but they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as, it was, as was that of the two men. So he says, yes, Timothy, you're, you in your day, you in your age, in the last days of the Old Covenant period in the first century, you're going to be facing a society that is in decline, a cultural collapse. Uh, you, you'll be facing people that are hostile to the gospel, that are caught up in their sins. You'll be facing all sorts of immorality. But don't give up, because if you're faithful, the, uh, the uh, folly of this way of life, the falseness of this teaching will be evident to all. So a second defeatist belief is that my faith is merely private. Now, obviously, all of our faith has to be personal and private. We need a private, intimate, and personal relationship with Jesus. Uh, that's the very foundation of our uh, Christian lives. But it can't be merely that. It's not only that. We are saved not just so that we can be saved with Jesus forever. We are saved for a purpose. We are saved come into the kingdom of God and to be servants of the king and to expand his kingdom. Have you never prayed as a Christian the Lord's Prayer? Jesus said to pray like this. In other words, this was to be our priorities as we address God and then as we, uh, as we seek the fulfillment of those prayers in our own lives. First and foremost, the glory of our Father in heaven and at the hallowing of his name. And then we go on to say, your kingdom come. Every kingdom needs a king, and we have King, King Jesus, who is uh, uh, seated at the right hand of God the Father, and all power in heaven and on earth has been delivered to him. That's what the Bible teaches. So we have a king, and he has authority, he has full authority in, on earth as he has in heaven. But he does say, your kingdom come. That means that we need to be involved in the coming of that kingdom. In other words, we need to be acting, behaving like he is our king. He is our boss. He is the rule giver. And we need, be, need to be living for him. And therefore, we need to seek what his will is. Where do we find his will? We find it in the word of God. And we need to be seeking not this uh, as some, some lofty ambition that we will only ever enjoy when we die and go to heaven. But no. It should be happening in this life, on this earth, now. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we pray. And we need to recapture both of those things that evil and falsehood and immorality and everything else, the folly of it will eventually become evident to all. But we also need to be praying uh, that God would make us faithful ambassadors, faithful representatives of his kingdom so that we can expand his kingdom. <clears throat> so here is, um, here is Ezra. And he's, uh, he's finished writing all of these gene genealogies, nine chapters of genealogies, and now the story begins. And it begins in a difficult place. It begins with the story of King Saul. Now, he, he's already consulted one and two kings as we find them, and one and two Samuel, as we find them in our, in our Bibles. He's consulted a other, other, number of other documents that were available at the time, and he knows that the story of Saul is quite familiar, but he wants to try and sum up. He wants to try and recognize where did Israel first go wrong? They had a kingdom. And yet that kingdom was on unstable foundation, and that kingdom collapsed. King Saul, the very first king of Israel, was Israel's course, a choice according to the flesh. Uh, king Saul was taller than other men, more handsome than other men. He was the natural charismatic choice, the popular choice of the people, the democratic choice, if you like. Obviously, there wasn't a democracy, but he was certainly the popular choice of the people. And yet, all that he did, he did in the power of the flesh. Even his worship of God was in the power of the flesh. And even though he got excited about God from time to time, it was all in the power of the flesh. It was all in what he could do. It was all in what he could bring to God. And when God let him down, when he, as far as he was concerned, he thought, well, I've got to do God's work for him because God's not willing to do it himself. And so really, 
before Ezra starts on the whole story of the kingdom and the construction of the temple and all of the other glorious things to come, he says, this is how you lose the kingdom. Learn from this. Don't lose the kingdom of God. Don't lose the priority of having God as king. Learn from the mistakes of the past. Don't repeat those mistakes. And so he starts off. This is how you lose a kingdom. Here's the warning. Uh, um, The first and foremost thing is to ignore God. He writes, 1 Chronicles chapter 10, verses 1 to 3. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons, and the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Aminadab and Micashua, the sons of Saul. And the battle pressed hard against Saul, and the archers found him, and he was wounded by the archers. And so, how did Saul get himself into this mess? He got himself into this mess because he had established a long pattern of ignoring God. God was no longer his first and foremost priority, if it ever was. There were times in his life when he got quite excited and people would, uh, would even mock him about his, uh, his religious attendance. Oh, it's all among the prophets now, they used, to, uh, they used to, uh, to say, because they knew ultimately he wasn't sincere. They knew that this wasn't a genuine expression of his heart. And so... Saul. Saul had learned over his lifetime, over the reign of his kingdom, that he had to deal with things in a very pragmatic way. He had to think about things from a secular viewpoint. He had secular responsibilities. And therefore, God has hid, had his kingdom, and God had given him his kingdom, and never the two should meet. He was willing to, to give to God what belonged to God, which be honest, wasn't very much, and he was willing to give to himself what he thought belonged to himself. As king, he thought he had the authority to to do as he thought right. God became irrelevant to him. And really, that's the story of the church. Sadly, uh, many, many churches seek to change the world by making the world like them. All the world doesn't like Christians because our music is boring. So let's make the wor- uh, the, our music more appealing to the world. Let's, uh, uh, let's uh, make it a lot more fun. People say that the church is boring. Well, let's make the church much more entertaining. People say that uh, our understanding of sexuality is old-fashioned. Well, let's change that as well. People say that we're hateful bigots. Well, let's prove that we're more inclusive than anybody else, that we're more loving and more accepting of anybody and everybody. People say that it's uh, a little bit narrow-minded to think that Jesus is only the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, It's it's old-fashioned and irrelevant to believe that the Bible is the word of God. Well, let's get rid of that and uh, let's pretend that all paths lead to God. Let's pretend that uh, uh, God just wants us all to be nice and he doesn't matter what path we take to him. It doesn't matter whether we have this religion or that religion or no religion at all because God is super, super nice. It was the irrelevance of God. It was the irrelevance of God to to Saul, and it's the irrelevance of God that has led uh, um, many, many Christians to start watering down their faith and changing it. But if we allow God to be God, if we allow him to speak through the word of God, the Bible, if we allow his full authority, his full revealed authority to uh, to be spoken to us through the word of God, if we think about it and pray about it, if we seek his truth and try to live it out in our lives, that's what it means to have a king. Jesus is our king. He has a rule book. He has a law book. He has revealed his will. We pray your will be done on, on earth as it is in heaven. And so we seek the word of God in every aspect of our lives as we think about our uh, our public lives and our private lives, as we think about our government, as we think about local government, as we think think about the needs of our local community, as well as our own personal relationship with Jesus. As we think about everything, God is at the center and we bring every thought captive to the obedience of the word of God. That's what we seek to do. So God has to be absolutely relevant to us in every aspect of our lives. 
Second thing is that um, uh, Saul decided to be pro-choice and not pro-life. What do I mean by that? Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest the uncircumcised come and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore, Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When his armor bearer saw that Saul had died, he also fell on his sword and died. Saul, Saul was ultimately a coward at the very end of his life. He ultimately wanted the easy way out. He didn't want to continue to fight uh, uh, God's battles. And therefore, when things got tough, he decided that it was his choice. He was going to choose the way that he was going to leave this world, not God. He was going to choose to take his own life. And of course, this is another manifestation of a culture in collapse. It means that we as individual humans, we decide uh, that who should live and who should die and who it's uh, legitimate to kill and who it's not legitimate to kill. We decide for ourselves, by our own standards, whether it's an unborn child or whether it's somebody at the end of their lives, it's up to us. And because we're more compassionate than God, we know better than God. And so we decide, well, I've decided that this person's uh, life isn't worth much anymore. I've decided that my own life is more important and I'll decide when my life isn't important to me anymore. And so we become pro-choice. It's my choice, not God's choice. But the alternative to that is to be pro-life, is to say, no matter what, I will seek to be a faithful representative of Jesus Christ. No matter what, I will seek to defend the most vulnerable, both at the end of their, their lives and at the beginning of their lives. I will pray for them. I will encourage them. I will seek support for them. I will seek legal protection for them because God has called me to be a representative of the more, most poor, the most vulnerable, the most weak. And how much more is that true for the unborn and for those who are, uh, who are at the end of their lives? Another problem was embracing, quote unquote, alternative spirituality. Uh, we're going to skip forward in the chapter and we're going to have another reminder. Ezra reminds us and tells us explicitly about why Saul died, about why his kingdom collapsed. So Saul died for his breach of faith, the old-fashioned religion, uh, that, uh, that religion, that patriarchal religion, that, book of, uh, that uh, religion that comes from the book, that was no longer relevant to Saul. His faith, that relationship he was supposed to have with God wasn't important to him. He had a breach of faith. He broke his trust with the Lord. He broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord. And so he didn't take the word of God seriously. He didn't think that the word of God was sufficient. He didn't think that obedience to God was sufficient. He didn't think that all of these things were enough. Rather, he decided to seek alternative spirituality. He decided to be more broad-minded than this narrow-minded God. He decided that there was other alternative spiritual experiences that he would be open to. He also consulted a medium seeking guidance. And so Saul went to a medium. He went to a spiritualist. He went to somebody who spoke to the dead, who called up spirits, the, the uh, witch of Endor. We have that truly horrifying description of him trying to deceive her and then her realizing who he was and of him promising that no harm would come to her and then of this spirit of Saul apparently coming up before him. He sought alternative spirituality, but it is God himself who uh, in his wisdom says, don't seek these occult evil forms. Don't be deceived by them. Don't think you can take shortcuts. Don't open yourself up to these manipulations. And that's the sad thing. I have no, no idea 
how much of spiritualism and how much of occult, occultism and how much of mediumism is genuinely satanic and is manifestations of demons and how much is just mere trickery, mere sleight of hands and suggestion, mere work of the flesh and the influence of the world. There's all sorts of psychological techniques that you can use to hoodwink somebody and to manipulate them. There's all sorts of things that you can learn in books about how to read a person and how to make them uh, give little hints and clues that mediums and spiritists and, uh, and uh, people who, um, who use hypnotism, they, uh, these uh, master manipulators use them to, uh, to control people to make people feel vulnerable, to make, uh, keep people coming back, to open their purse strings and to ultimately rob them. There is that work of just sheer charlatanism that is very much a part of the occult, but it's also an open door to more sinister forces, dark and evil forces. And our God doesn't want us to be lied to, to be manipulated, to be robbed, to, uh, to be enslaved to other people, nor does he want to open up ourselves and our culture and, our da uh, um, and damage ourselves and our children and our culture by opening ourselves up to these dark spiritual forces. And so, that was the problem. They uh, um, Saul thought that he knew better than God Fourthly, is the accepting of defeat. I've already talked about some of the defeatist ideas that Christians can have. And we see the same problem in this passage. Thus Saul died. <clears throat> he and his three sons and all his house died together. And when all the men of Israel who were in the valley saw that the army had fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled, and the Philistines came and lived in them. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. And they stripped him and took his head and his armor and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to their idols and to the people. And they put his armor in the temple of their gods and fastened his head to the temple of Dagon. The people of God just gave up. They were defeatists. They thought, Let's abandon the battlefield. There's nothing more that we can do. And therefore, they handed over everything in their culture, everything in their land to the Philistines. And the Philistines robbed it all, took it all for themselves. And we're in the same place. Uh, once beautiful churches have now been converted into houses or carpet warehouses, or they've been turned into skateboard rinks, or they have been pulled down, or uh, they have been... Uh, closed up and boarded up, or they're just merely historical museums. Places where the gospel was preached, people where, places where people received consolation, hope, and joy have been closed down. And this is true more, uh, more generally. Uh, our schools, which once had a solid Christian foundation, now teach things that are profoundly damaging to children and confuse themselves about their identities and uh, lead them to make profoundly life-altering decisions about their own body and about their own identity. We've handed over our media. There was once a time when many Christians would write into the BBC to complain about blasphemy, to complain about immorality, and uh, the BBC had to listen. They had to restrain themselves, and now that has all been handed over to the Philistines, and now we see all the immorality that we see on the TV. The whole battlefield has been abandoned by Christians largely, and we cannot allow that. We need to remember that our God, the Lord Jesus Christ, should be at the center of everything in our culture, and we should make no apology about that whatsoever. So now let's think about how to rebuild a kingdom. I began this talk about uh, talking about the two defeatist attitudes one is that defeat is in, uh, inevitable, and the second being my faith is merely private. So Saul, sorry, uh, so um, Ezra. Ezra talks about the men of Jabesh Gilead. And when all Jabesh Gilead heard that the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and took 
away the body of Saul and the bodies of his son and brought them to Jabesh. And they buried their bones under the oak in Jabesh and fasted seven days, although their numbers were tiny. One tiny little village of Jabesh Gilead. One tiny group of people among a, a, a nation of hundreds of thousands, if not millions. One small village, a group of courageous men, one small group, like a church, one individual church, like Parkside today. Just a small group of men decided, no, we will not be cowards. We will do something courageous. We will do the right thing. We will not be defeatist because our faith is not merely private. We know that it is an insult to our God to see the, uh, the body and the head of our once beloved king Lord, though he was, we know that he was a representative of the, of the people of God and we as the people of God have been insulted and grieved by this. We will do this one glorious thing. We will rescue the body of our, one, of our now dead king and we will bury him in the full expectation of the resurrection to come. We trust our God. We know that our faith is not merely private, Rather, we must see it acted out in our lives, and we will be courageous. And so we too need to be do, willing to do the same. We need to be praying for those men of Jabesh Gilead to arise out of our church and our churches and all the other faithful churches, that God would raise up a new group of men, a new uh, generation of people that are willing to take a stand for God and do courageous and bold things for God so that the glory of our king will no longer be insulted, so that we can stand proud and tall uh, again, knowing that although our numbers are small, knowing that although we can't defeat all the Philistines that have taken over our culture all by ourselves, we can be faithful in the things that God calls us to be faithful to. We can be faithful in small and limited things and do good things, and we can then act as a role model act as something that could, other people can respect and admire and copy. And they too can do the same. And so the men of Jabesh Gilead are the first hope that as King David comes on, as he starts to restore the kingdom, as he starts to step in and do good things for the kingdom of God, the men of Jabesh Gilead were the first ones to do that. So my challenge to you, whether you're a member of Parkside Evangelical Church or you're watching this in another church, uh, you're a member of a different church in a different country, in a different county, in a different part of England, it doesn't matter. You too can be faithful. You too can do something as God enables you with people in your church. You can do something to advance the kingdom of God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we pray, dear Lord, you would help us to do something bold for the kingdom of God. Help us never to merely be content with a private faith, though precious and wonderful and joy-giving that is. May that joy, may that privilege be therefore a motive for us to advance your kingdom. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to conclude our worship uh, with uh, this, O oh, breath of life, come sweeping through us. Will you sing this with me with joy and expectation in your heart and sing it as a prayer to God asking that God would send his Holy Spirit and revive his people once again.
hope and pray that that was a challenge for you and that you go in the challenge of that, but also in the blessing of all the joy of us being the servants of our glorious King and the wonderfully loved people of God. That this will empower you, bless you and guide you throughout the whole of this coming week. Now, will you say the grace with me? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Hallelujah.